That's my place. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. You guys? Yeah, see, DC's not here, so we... <laughs> John, can you hear me okay? okay. No, just my... Sorry about that. I got all that. Is that better? <laughs> Good morning again. The title of my message today is uh, Repentance Unto Life. This was actually the title of a sermon delivered on the Sabbath morning, September 23rd, 1855, by the Reverend Charles Hadley Spurgeon at New York Street Chapel in London, England. This sermon is not Spurgeon's sermon, nor do I and will, will I ever have any illusion that I will ever preach as Charles Spurgeon. But I do pray that God will speak through me today to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, just as he spoke through Charles Spurgeon and as he speaks through our pastor, Jarvis Philpot. My scripture for today and all of the scripture that you'll see today comes from the New American Standard Bible, maybe one of the most literal translations of the Bible that we have today. In Matthew 7, 21-23, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, says Jesus, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This verse implies that eternal salvation requires more than just an, an acknowledgement that Jesus Christ is, is our Lord, more than just an, an acknowledgement is required. This verse states that many people, maybe millions, sadly, maybe some of us, maybe you, many who claim to be a Christian based on mere acknowledgement of Jesus Christ, will perish on Judgment Day. Even Satan and his demons acknowledge Jesus Christ. James 2.19, the Bible says that you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. <clears throat> There's a widespread teaching in evangelical circles today, including, sadly, many Southern Baptist churches. And this common teaching is called Easy Believism. Phil Bill Bennett, professor of pastoral ministry at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, states that the greatest heresy plaguing Southern Baptists today is the concept of easy believism. Easy believism states that all that is required for one to be saved is that they believe the facts of the gospel and verbalize those facts to God in prayer. But it's not necessary to repent and to be changed in lifestyle. Billy Graham in an interview to Christianity Today, spoke to this. I quote Billy Graham, As I approached my 95th birthday, I was burdened to write a book that addressed the epidemic of easy believism. There is a mindset today that if people believe in God and do good works, 
they are going to heaven. It should not be surprising, then, that many people believe easily in a God who makes no demands, but this is not the God of the Bible. Satan has cleverly misled people by whispering that they can believe in Jesus Christ without being changed. That is the devil's lie. To those who say you can have Christ without giving anything up, Satan is deceiving you. So the question I ask today, what is required for a person to be saved? And to possess the assurance that he is destined for heaven when he or she dies. Well, let's look at the Bible. Numerous verses assert that by faith we are saved. In Acts 16.31, says, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Faith is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And in Hebrews 11.6, <clears throat> the writer says, And without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. These verses, and many others, assert that faith, a gift from God, is what saves us. And based on these verses... Easy believism states that no commitment of any kind is called for or required since we are saved by faith and faith alone. According to easy believism, to require a change in one's life and action would be the same as teaching salvation by works. While numerous verses do assert that faith is the key to salvation, Many other verses cite repentance as necessary for salvation. Acts 3, 19, 19 through 20, I, I partially quote that, says, Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. 2 Corinthians seven ten says, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. And finally, in 1 John 2, 4 through 6, John the Apostle writes, The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says he abides in Him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Many verses say faith. Many verses say repentance. Is this a contradiction? Not if we understand faith and repentance are essentially the same thing. Opposite sides of the same coin. Faith and repentance are like life and breath. Without breath, there is no life. Likewise, without life, there is no breath. Both are required, life and breath. The same is true regarding faith and repentance. When we turn to God in faith, inherent Inherent in this same turn is a turn away from our former life, which we call repentance. We cannot turn to God without turning from something. We cannot give our life to God and stay the same as we are. Matthew 16, 24 through 25 says... Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, 
he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Faith and repentance are so inseparable that these terms can be used interchangeably. You cannot have faith, true faith, without at least a desire for repentance. Well, isn't repentance deeds? And the Bible is clear that we're not saved based on our deeds. Well, both faith and repentance are given as a gift from God. Acts 5.31 says, He is the one whom God exalted to His right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And Acts 11.18 says, When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. If repentance is a gift, which the Bible says it is, then it's not a, matori- a, a work based on merit, and it, therefore it's not a basis for boasting. Deeds and repentance are not synonymous. Instead, deeds are the result of repentance. Paul made this distinction between repentance and the works that arise out of a changed and repentant heart. In Acts 26, 20, Paul writes, But kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and, and performing deeds appropriate to repentance. In the same way that repentance and deeds are not the same thing, faith and deeds are also distinguishable. While faith and repentance represent a change of heart, deeds represent the fruit arising from this changed heart. Therefore, because faith and repentance are together a gift of a change of the new birth of a changed life they should not become the basis for boasting and arrogance of course none of us are without sin and none of us will ever lead a sinless life however that's not essential because we can be in right standing with our savior even though we sin He gives us the assurance that if we confess our sins, and of course this entails a willingness to repent, we are given the assurance that our Savior will forgive and will cleanse us from all of our sins. John 1.9 states, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgiveness that John writes about, forgiveness depends on confession and repentance. What about those individuals who confess they are saved, but never commit, never repent, never surrender their lives to God? Are they saved because of a one-time decision of inviting Jesus into their hearts? though there was never any repentance or change in their life? Repentance must accompany a true saving faith. If it doesn't, that faith becomes questionable. True faith in Christ will always lead to a changed life. Those who continue to walk according to the flesh, 
who do not show at least a desire to repent are not saved. Romans 8, 5, 8 says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are, in, who are in the flesh cannot please God. Salvation is certainly free, but at the same time, it cost us everything. We are to die to ourselves as we change into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Let me, here's an illustration. Let me illustrate the inseparability of faith and repentance. If someone said, I really believe in Jesus and I want to be baptized. However, I am having an extramarital affair and I refuse to repent of it. I would have to answer them. If you refuse to repent, to repent, then you don't trust Christ. If you did trust Christ, you would repent and obey and follow Him. Your faith is like the devil's faith. He too believes in Jesus, but his faith isn't a saving faith. A saving faith is one that turns to Jesus and trusting our lives into His hands. A saving faith is one that surrenders to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. A refusal to repent and a claim of faith are in contradiction to one another. A real faith must entail a real willingness or at least a desire to follow Jesus. The Christian life must be characterized by a changed life. It's not optional. Amen. Where, easy believe, where easy believism fails is its lack of recognition that a person who, with faith in Jesus Christ will lead a progressively changed life. Salvation is a free gift from God to those given the, the gifts of faith and repentance. Discipleship and obedience are the response that will no doubt occur and must occur when one truly comes to Christ in faith and repentance. Well, these discussions about faith and repentance, about faith and deeds, these discussions have been going on since Jesus walked on this earth. And, they will, and discussions will continue to go on about those topics until Jesus returns. All this can be confusing. But as my friend Darius points out, our God is not a God of confusion. How can we be sure that on that judgment day, a day each and every one of us will face. All of us, one day, will stand before God. How can we be sure that on that day, our name is written in the book of life? I pray that none of us will hear Jesus say, I never knew you, depart from me. In 1 John, there are three tests. In, well, in 1 John and the Gospel of John, there are three tests that identify followers of Jesus Christ. Some call these the three tests of authentic Christianity. I put those three tests in your bulletin, along with Scripture verses. Briefly, these tests... The first test, the test of belief in Jesus Christ. 
Do we believe that Christ is our Savior? That Christ is the Son of God? And that Christ did come in the flesh? It's the first test. The second test, the test of love. As a mark of discipleship, a commandment to prove that we are His friends, love is evidence of abiding in the light. It's evidence of having passed from death to life. And it is evidence and shows evidence of knowing God and being born of God. And the final test, the third test, authentic Christianity, the test of obedience. Obedience is essential to having fellowship with the Father. It's essential to knowing God. It's essential to loving God. It's essential to abiding in Jesus. And it's essential to being a child of God. And finally, obedience is essential to having our prayers answered. Is your name written in the book of life? Do you repent from your sins? And will you surrender to God? In summary, I ask you to listen to the words of Moses as he was speaking near the end of his life. And in Deuteronomy 30, 19 through 20, Moses declares, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying His voice, and by holding fast to Him, for this is your life and the length of your days. Is your name written in the book of life? Do you surrender from your sins, and will you surrender to God? Marcia?
believe now we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Is that? Oh, we're going to have an invitation. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So, as our musicians come to the front, and as our pastor Jarvis, a true man of God, comes to the front, I invite you. If you want to know Jesus more, I invite you. If you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, I invite you. If you have unconfessed sin, if you want to repent, I invite you. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, I plead with you. Come. Would you stand?